cannot 
rob God of being generous. So in Jesus, we can trust God to be a father who is a good host, who throws a great party, a generous host who calls us to be generous in our relationships, with our time, with our money, with all of our resources, especially with those who feel like the people who have made us experience scarcity in our lives, the people who feel who make us feel like we need to hoard our resources, like, oh my gosh, my time, don't want to give it to that person, oh my gosh, my money, can't give it to that person, oh my gosh, my energy, my heart, my compassion, can't give it to them. The Apostle Paul's letter to one of the first churches, uh, the Ephesian church, we see them wrestling with how difficult it is to be done. I mean, they've said yes to Jesus. Uh, and it is so hard to treat one another justly, even within their own church, to forgive one another, to be reconciled, even within that early community of believers. So if you've got your Bibles, or if you have your MHV app open, just turn to the, the Bible app in there, and we're going to read Ephesians chapter 2, um, and parts of verses 14 to 22. And this is the message translation. The Messiah has made things up between us so that we're now together on this, both non-Jewish outsiders and Jewish insiders. He tore down the wall we used to keep each other at a distance. Christ brought us together through his death on the cross. Christ got us to embrace, the cross got us to embrace, and that was the end of hostility. Christ came and preached peace to you outsiders and peace to us insiders. He treated us as equals and so made us equals. Through him, we both share the same spirit and have equal access to the Father. God is building a home. He's using us all, irrespective of how we got here, in what he is building. So I love this. The cross got us to embrace through making peace. When we declare that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, we do so much more than simply declare that this gift of peace is just for ourselves, for us individually, you know, the, the Hebrew word shalom, or peace, that Hebrew word for peace is not simply the absence of conflict. It is not simply the absence of need. The word shalom, the word for peace in Hebrew, points us to the fact that peace is not the absence of these things, but is found in the presence of a person. This person named Jesus, the Prince of Healing. Shalom peace means healing, fixing broken things in every aspect of life. So not only physical healing, not only emotional healing, but shalom peace cries out for works of mercy and justice in our society in a world that constantly pulls us towards that natural division, towards clicks, towards fracture, towards suffering. And I, this morning, remind us that we cannot do this work. We cannot experience shalom, peace, without the power of Jesus Christ. Those dividing walls of hostility Cannot, they will not come down without Jesus, without the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. Those dividing walls of hostility that are captured by so many of those isms today, sexism, classism, racism. I mean, I wish I could say, yeah, you know, like that, those things, like it's just been since the 60s. We just, we just gotta fix it, you know? We just gotta try a little bit harder, just a little bit more progress. But the Bible points us to the truth that this stuff runs deep in humanity. Like, like you know, all the way to the beginning. Like, all the way to, you know, the first.
first woman, the first man, Adam and Eve, to those earliest of cultures. These manifestations um, are documented in the Bible, these dividing walls of hostility. You know, we can start with Genesis, with the serpent, this being who is literally called enmity. <laughs> you know, this this creature who is called Satan and gets right between Adam and Eve, right between them to cause distrust, right between them to cause distrust between humanity and God. We get the story of the Tower of Babel, this picture of dividing walls of hostility, nation against nation, tribe against tribe, ethnic group against ethnic group. In the New Testament, we get the stories of Caesar, of the powerful empire that exploits vulnerable and oppressed Israel. We get Jesus' teaching about the God of man, about the God of materialism, the God of consumerism, the God of wealth, where the rich exploit the poor, where the wealthy hoard their riches so they can become more rich while sitting on the backs of and here's what Jesus helps us to remember. These material moments in history are spiritual moments in history. What we can see is also, is also mimicked in the spiritual realm, in a spiritual battle, a kingdom battle that has to be fought with the power of the Holy Spirit if only we had the eyes to see. And we receive that spirit to fight, to wage good battle, to wage kingdom battle through Jesus. You know, later on in the book of Ephesians, Paul goes on to talk to this baby church to, to, to remind them that the battle, that the struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers, it's against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And through Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, the work of reversing that curse is already taking place. It is already happening where the Holy Spirit is reconciling all things to God by his shalom. Shalom peace that leads us to reconciliation because reconciliation moves us from fragmentation to peace. Reconciliation restores relationship. It is not simply the absence of conflict. God makes the first move to restore relationship between himself and humanity and creation. And through Jesus, God offers forgiveness with justice. Making things right. Reconciliation happens when we move from the yeah, turned off. The whole thing. All right. I'll just keep on talking to you. So reconciliation happens when we move from fragmentation to wholeness, and where a relationship has been shattered, the Holy Spirit can come to help bring restoration. And again, those dividing walls get torn down even between oppressor and victim. Bluetooth, Harry. Huh? Reconciliation. I'm going to skip to a slide, Cheryl. Reconciliation mm -hmm. is forgiveness with justice. Reconciliation is forgiveness with justice. And so how can generosity in our relationships yoke forgiveness with justice to move toward that wholeness, that shalom of reconciliation with our friends, with our family, with our neighbors, with people in our own church, in our city? So I want to say this. Kingdom reconciliation begins with what we do for each other. There is so much we want to do in this city. There's so much we want to do in Park Hill, in Central Park, in Capitol Hill. I mean, there's so much to do. But 
can we begin with what we do with each other as an active community, as an active family, where we can only offer what we understand and believe, what we are called to first with each other. That our healing is wrapped up in one another's healing. And of course, Jesus does not say we do this by ignoring our pain, by sweeping things under the rug so that we can do church. No. I know this room right now is filled with trauma, with stories of pain, with betrayal, with suspicion, with regret. But I know this room, I know the people of God have experienced supernatural, miraculous stories of the kind of forgiveness and peacemaking that leads to the justice of reconciliation. And so as people who have said yes to Jesus, we resist and we heal the destructive, harassing lies of the enemy so that we can declare equal peace. Equal peace for outsiders and insiders alike. And this reconciliation does not happen without us getting proximate to one another. And so in the spirit of us, in the spirit of God using all of us to build this kind of home, um, I want to invite Stephen Brackett to, to share some of his heart about what it has meant in his life as a Denver native to get proximate here in our city. You know, he's done this with his band Flowboss. He's done it with his work as the director of special programs for Youth on Record. He's doing it right here in Park Hill as one of our life circle leaders. Um, so welcome, welcome, Stefan. It's just a little precaution. <laughs> Have you all seen that um, thing going around right now where uh, they cut open the bath toys? You know, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so, like they cut open those rubber duckies and they find out they're filled with black mold no. and all of these terrible things. Like a kid was hospitalized because he squirted himself in the water. <laughs> he died the rubber ducky and gave himself some incredible infection. Oh I'm saying this because if any of y'all have ever um, prayer before today, she's like, oh, and Steph will be preaching. And I was like, Preaching. This is a testimonial. This is preaching. That's it feels like a whole other level. Um, but, but in that spirit, stepping into it, um, just really happy to be here. Happy to be with all y'all in your super cute boots. There we go. Like some, some, some of y'all, your those Nikes, those Nike shoes are. Alright, right, getting away from commercialism, capitalism. Let's get to go. Right. Um, um, in my life, I've been called a social justice warrior, uh, and no derogative, I take it with pride. Um, it's been a lifetime orientation, and I think a lot of times, like, just real quick, how many people are feeling as though they wish they could do more right now? Or like, how about, uh, particularly like when, when the country was alive with people protesting and marching, like feeling like, well, how can I contribute? Anybody feel that way? Like, wanting to do more? Well, I want to speak directly to the limitation of being fully involved. Um, there have been times in my life, especially with my band, there was one action that we did in particular. Um, I mean, how many of y'all were here during the DOC when Barack Obama was nominated? Okay. So my band, uh, in coordination with Rage Against the Machine and several other organizations, put them on a show at the, uh, at the Denver Coliseum. Free show, whole point of it was to get a few thousand people in Denver together. And then once we had enough folks, we were representing the Iraq veterans against the war, and we were going to take the show and lead an unpermitted march all the way down to the Pepsi Center to give our list of demands given to the Democratic National Convention on the behalf of veterans who felt like their voices had been unheard. Now, as an activist, you never expect anything to actually work. Right? You, 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 you do it because you're supposed to do it, um, and you just keep on refining your practices. But long story short, the march that started out with 3,000 people ended up being 11,000. 
We illegally marched with such force and strength and such discipline. Because from the stage, we told people what they were doing and what you're not doing. Like, this is nonviolent. You're standing with the veterans, and you will not take up any kind of action against anybody. Um, here's the legal line. Here's how we stay safe. We did all these things in anticipation of it being horrible. Um, we had already heard before we'd even started the show that SWAT teams from the suburbs were coming down to stop our march because they had heard word that people were already arming themselves, even though our march hadn't been done. So this is before we started. But when the march happened, the most unexpected thing happened. It worked. 11,000 people marched to the Coliseum, we marched to the Pepsi Center. We were so strong, so many folks that they actually let our delegates in from the Iraq veterans of the war, and they were able to make their list of demands heard, and those list of demands were read by the leaders of the Democratic National Convention. I spoke with some of the young women, women and men from Iraq veterans against the war, and you could see them like afterwards, they were kind of glowing. They felt, you could see that like all the friends that they had lost, all the pain that they had suffered, um, was somehow given meaning in that moment because they were validated. And then, maybe three days afterwards, all of us fell into a deep depression. We had won. We had won. But it wasn't enough. It's, it's one thing to be able to give all of your time and energy to something in the hope of achieving some kind of justice that the world tells us is justice. But I can't tell you how many times I've talked to my friends within movement, and that depression is this overwhelming cloud that hangs as a pall throughout all of the actions. Just yesterday, I was talking to a friend of mine who's one of the most effective people I know in movement. She's also one of like the few Christian folks I know who are like organizing on the radical left. And what she had done is she's like, hey, I need a few of you to just talk to me about the work that I'm doing because I'm in a really low place. Because in 2016, she was overseeing this national movement initiative. And now that we're on this election cycle, she's like, I know that I didn't do enough. And like, I keep on eating myself up about, what if I'd done this a little bit better? And I gotta tell you all, this is the first time I talked to my friend that she was doubting her faith. She was wondering if she didn't hear God's voice anymore. But that was the main thing that got her into movement. So, I'm saying all of these things to say that even if someone were fully involved in movement, there is a limitation to what the idea of justice in this world will bring you. Uh, what is it? Psalms 3311. Uh, the plans of God stand firm forever. But the plans that we have around justice are very small. We live here in the Wild West. The most popular films in America are superhero movies. We have a myth around violence being the best solution. I am somebody who hates guns. I've had guns pointed at me, even by my own father. I despise them, but for the first time in my life, I've been thinking about getting one. Has that been anybody else? Has that occurred to anybody else? How close to Jesus is that solution? But the world will tell us that we need to be afraid, and we need to defend something, and we need to protect something. So in that, it's so easy to think that our solution is in defending. Jared, right? You, my man, are one of the few people who I felt like in a time of crisis actively did something compassionate in a way that was not protecting your resources, protecting the ranch with your shotgun. During COVID, you were going around giving out your phone number to your neighbors, trying to make sure that they could be taken care of and if they needed something, they could reach you. I spend a lot of time not being angry at powers and principalities. I get angry at relatives and other people. I mean, how many of y'all spend a lot of time just being angry at folks as opposed to these powers and principalities? When we do that kind of stuff, it's so easy for us not to do the solution of, do you have water? Do you have food? This is not a time of 
in order to press us. This is a time of incredible opportunity for us as Christians to show up as Christians. I've been an activist. I still am an activist. That's not enough. For the wounds that we are facing right now, for the pain that's in this moment, when we talk about reconciliation, we're talking about healing. How many of you all have suffered a devastating injury that took weeks to heal? Has anybody had surgery? Was that recovery fun? Healing hurts. Healing takes time. Healing is a dialogue. Justice as we are describing it in America is a shouting match. It is a monologue where I am defending myself, my ideas, and my property, and I do not need to hear from somebody else. When we are healing, we're talking. If we're even healing with our own bodies, if we're not listening, we can do more damage. I used to be a professional dancer, I used to be a break dancer. I am so far from that now. <laughs> I tore my ACL on one of the biggest nights of my dancing career, um, but I didn't know that I had torn it. And so, when I went to the doctors, they were telling me, like, well, what kind of stuff are you doing on your leg? I'm like, well, I'm still doing my backflips and all these things. <laughs> like, oh, it can't be told. You're fine. You're all good. And so I danced professionally on that leg for two years. And then on the night when I was going to be dancing with all of the people within the hip-hop movement that I most respected, like people who created it, um, I'd say these names would be probably lost in you know, inside baseball. But there was a night, I, a kid from Denver, Colorado, was going to be up on stage with people who invented pop it and lock it and break it and all these things. And I found out that my ACL was torn. It had been torn for two years and I'd done tons of damage. The reason I'm saying this is that's the dialogue portion of the healing. We have to be in communication with the wound in order to make something heal. As Christians, we have to be in communication with the deep wounds that this country has been predicated on. But the beautiful thing about it is that it's not necessarily a big, broad, broad stroke type of thing. It's as Kathy was saying, it's like, how do we show up for each other and not highlighting our own needs first? Right. How do we start looking out for other people? And in the process, we will see Jesus. We will get closer to God. And in this process of crisis, anytime that we face adversity, we face the volume of the world turning up and drowning out healing, compassion, his words, his mercy. In this point in time, I can tell you that I've been through so many meetings, I've been sat down with so many other activists, and we are planning, and we are plotting, and we are scheming. And this is something I, I loathe to admit, but how many of you all had like, a massive fight with your spouse? And then like, later on realized that they were totally right. <laughs> so like, when Jim and I talk about this, she's like, well, what about the change of the heart? What about the change of the heart? And I'm like, well, it's about strategy. You know, it's about alignment. It's about polarization. So, well, what about the change of the heart? And that's what that conversation with my friend was about. For all the work that we've done, if our hearts don't change, then the work will ring hollow. So I am ecstatic to be in this building in this time, in this church, where we can all, as a group of people, align around caring for each other. And one of the most beautiful things about Jesus is that I think that as much as he asks for us, the ways that we can be superheroes show up in the mundane on a daily basis. Right? How are we taking care of each other? Yes, the political moment is massive, Yes, the world is burning, but we have to keep in mind that when Jesus was preaching, the world was not a stable place either. This is a gospel for tough times. This is a gospel for times and crisis and how we show up despite that. We are meant to be the light of the world, and we can do that by showing our love for each other. And that love shows up in like talking to your neighbors and making sure that they've got what they need, praying for each other in the church. Praying for those who are outside of the church. Making sure that we still insist upon the humanity of all of us on November 4th. Mm -hmm. There are categories that are given to us that are not real. And then there's one category that we all live under that is the realest thing of all.
So as a social justice warrior and break dancer and somebody who's being corrected by his wife on a regular basis, and thank you all for I hope that we all can be humble, regardless of how cute our boots are, humble enough to show up for each other and show up as a real community of Christ. So with that, we will go into communion. And Kathy, thank you. Sorry, Mr. <laughs> And in the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and as you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, and he will come again in victory. God, come to us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Be our healer this morning. As, as we close, I do want to share some words from the prayer ministry team this morning. And if any of these land with you, I'm going to invite you to just take a risk and to raise your hand. And someone from our prayer team is just going to come over and hover over you and pray over you rather than us trying to like move around too much. But if any of these words land with you, Raise your hand and get prayer today. And then Jason's going to lead us in a, in a song. But some of the things that we felt that God's Holy Spirit wanted to really uh, open up this morning is anyone who needs financial breakthrough this morning. You're listening to the sermon today and you are saying yes to being generous, but you feel crippled by your financial need. Raise your hand. Come, let's pray with you. Um, for some, some of here, folks here feel that you are just in a rush and a panic, and you just need God's peace this morning. Raise your hand so that we can pray for you to experience God's peace in the midst of the panic. And we do believe that God heals physically today. If there's anyone who has an ear infection, we'd love to pray for healing for your ear infection. And lastly, we had a picture of someone standing under a waterfall.
So Holy Spirit, come. For those of us who are able, let's just stand together. And again, raise your hands so some of, one of us can come over and pray with you. God, today is a new season. We're in a new building. It's snowing in October. <laughs> but God, we say yes to a new season of generosity and justice. God, you tell us to not be afraid. Help us to not be afraid as a community. God, new things can start in a winter season. New things can start when things look dead. Come, Holy Spirit, and heal us.